Hi, it's Dwyer, gamblersadvisory.com, a free site, bettingangle.us, a free site. Well, I just watched a historic heavyweight fight. Anthony Joshua has regained the heavyweight championship, uh, much to my chagrin betting-wise, big losses for me. You're going to hear a lot of people here online say, hey, I told you so, I told you so. If you were a Joshua supporter, I know uh, one of my subscribers, Kendall Knows Best, knew best, right, Kendall, congratulations. I hope you leave your thoughts in the fight, what surprised you, what didn't surprise you, in the comment section of this video. I have to tell you, I'm really surprised. I was not expecting Anthony Joshua to be able to pull this off, right? I wasn't surprised by the first two rounds of the fight where Joshua's on his horse. He's moving around the ring. Uh, Andy couldn't find him. Andy's trying to track him down. Didn't have the foot speed to track him down. I wasn't surprised about that because Joshua had lost a lot of weight, right? You don't lose weight to stay in the pocket. I thought Joshua understood that he had to do something different than in the first fight. And in the first fight, he tried to stay in the pocket and got knocked down four times. So as I watched the fight, I thought with certainty, right, that Joshua was going to slow down. That Joshua could not go from being a flat-footed fighter, a slugger, right, to a mobile fighter. Right? Understand, he has his right hand cocked, but Joshua has a pretty good left hand. And I was surprised that Joshua wasn't going to use that lead hand for more than a jab. Right? I just knew that by the time the seventh round came around, Joshua was going to start running out of steam, kind of like Kovalev did against Canelo. I just knew. In fact, you had a fight on this card. Michael Hunter against Povetkin. Hunter starts the fight, has great legs, is moving around. By the time the third round happens in that fight, Hunter had slowed down. I thought Anthony Joshua was necessarily going to slow down. You know, how could this guy go 36 minutes dancing around the ring? Well, guess what? It happened. Right? You get to the seventh round. Here's what surprised me in the fight. Joshua, big win. I credit him. I was wrong on this fight. You get to the seventh round, Joshua is still moving around the ring. Right now, what's amazing to me, and I'm bona fidely amazed by this, right? Joshua is landing some flush jabs. I did not expect him to be able to throw Chris jabs while on the move, right? It's different. You could be a jabber standing still, Sonny Liston, and then lose that jab if you try to throw it on the move. I just didn't see how Joshua in one training camp could develop the coordination, because that's what it takes. A lot of boxing is timing, coordination, to land crisp jabs repeatedly and to stay on the move. But that's exactly what happened. Let me also say, no matter how hard Joshua landed that jab, right? Joshua would not overextend himself by throwing a hellacious right hand behind it. On the telecast, The Zone, they were talking about Joshua becoming an Emmanuel Stewart fighter. Maybe in time. Maybe in time, right? Stewart fighters, whether it's Thomas the Hitman Hearns, who Stewart was with before Lennox Lewis, Right? Whether it was Lennox Lewis, whether it was Vladimir Klitschko, all of those guys, when they hit you with hard, clean jabs and the stiffness of Joshua's jab surprised me. I'm not going to hide the level of surprise I have. Right, When they hit you with crisp jabs, all of those guys would follow up with hard right hands. It's a one-two. Right here I noticed Joshua early in the fight is landing hard. I mean hard jabs. And then had the discipline to continue to move. 
right? He never gives Ruiz the opportunity to set up a pocket, right? Even when he has the upper hand on the first punch in the exchange. I was surprised by the extent to which Joshua moved. Later, Joshua starts throwing a straight right hand. Very accurate puncher. He lands some of the right hands. More importantly, he misses some of the right hands. But you notice that Ruiz is mindful of the right hand. A few times, Andy ducks inside and the right hand, you know, grazes him. But you understood that Andy was afraid to run up to him because of the implicit power. Now we've seen fights. I encourage people to look at the Cal Brook Gennady Golovkin fight where a fighter just runs over to the guy who has the faster feet. Just runs over to him. Right? And forces him to create a pocket. Tries to corner him. Right? Bum rushes him. But here Joshua is so accurate even on the move. And that's the biggest surprise for me. Right? That Andy Ruiz is afraid to just bum rush him. Right? The idea is that Joshua has the kind of power that can just appear at any time. Not only that, it's all heavy with Joshua. Right? This jab is a heavy jab. The right hand, of course, is a heavy right hand. Right? Joshua doesn't throw a lot of left hooks in the fight, but he does get off a couple. And you could tell they're heavy. Right? So the first thing that surprised me was Joshua's stamina. Right? I was not expecting, no matter what he did, the first third of the fight, I was not expecting him to keep it going. I've seen a lot of fights where a guy's moving a lot early, moving a lot early, staying away, staying away, staying away, only to slow down later and get caught. Right? This guy has pep in his step in the 11th and 12th rounds. Outstanding stamina. Right? I was also surprised. I was expecting Joshua to have a problem quite frankly, maintaining a stiff jab on the move. No, this jab is stiff. Right? The jab is stiff as he's moving away. I give him credit. Right? Another thing that surprised me. First fight, you saw Joshua's defense break down. No question about it. When they started to exchange, Joshua would get hit with shots, didn't know what to do. Right? Looked like Vladimir Klitschko against Corey Sanders. Go back and look at that fight. It's in my favorites folder here on YouTube. Well, this fight, he looks like Ali in the 70s. In other words, Andy Ruiz comes inside. Right? If Joshua threw a jab and missed, and Andy is about to jump in to set up a pocket, Joshua would lean forward and clinch him. Now if there's one area Andy needs to improve, can improve if he works on it, it's this clinching thing Joshua's doing. In other words, Joshua wouldn't trade with Andy. Joshua understands Andy's fast-handed. Joshua understands he can't let Andy start the combination. Right? So Joshua does a lot of clinching. A lot of clinching. And Andy needs to look at Golovkin films. He needs to look at Mayweather films. Right? There are a whole group of fighters. Mike McCallum. Right? Who wouldn't allow you to clinch them. In other words, Andy's coming in too straight. Andy's hands are too wide apart where Joshua is able to tie up both hands. Right? Andy needed to have a hand here. Golovkin does it really well. Right? Andy needed to have a hand here. So when Joshua tries to clinch him, Andy could then create space and keep the punch sequence going. Instead, we have an Ali Fraser situation here. 
right? Where, you know, Ruiz comes inside and Joshua clinches it. Joshua never has to spar his way out of the exchange, right? Joshua doesn't keep his hands going. What Joshua does is clinch Andy. And Andy, unfortunately, just didn't know how to avoid the clinch, right? Andy's coming in too straight. He's not at a side profile. Andy doesn't have a lot of ring coverage, right? So a Golovkin, a David Hay, they're far away from you, right? So you can't really assume you're going to be able to clinch them. Then when they come inside, right, they're able to come inside, but first throw punches to punch their way inside. You know, when a guy's punching you, it's hard to clinch him. You heard Sergio Mora in the telecast, and I thought Mora was excellent. You heard Mora talk about how Andy was not jabbing his way in. Right? Andy's trying to enter the pocket with power shots, in part because. Right? Joshua builds up a lead. Joshua starts dominating this fight from the first round. So I get the feeling Andy panicked a little bit. Maybe Andy was like me thinking, oh, he's going to run out of gas by the fourth round. He's going to run out of gas by the fifth round. Joshua, in magnificent shape, doesn't run out of gas. Right? Does not run out of gas. So then, of course, Andy tries to get desperate. Tries to throw home run punches. Right? Forgets that he needs to kind of jab his way in. To then do what he has to do. Let me also say this too. Andy has a low center of gravity. Right? Andy needed to duck his head more. He needed to get low. Because the way the Larry Holmes era ends. Right? Joshua's channeling Ali, Larry Holmes. Right? You know, guys with jabs. You know, you have a hard time getting close to the guy. Right? Guys are clinching when you get in close. The way that era ends is with Mike Tyson. Right? A shorter guy who can move fast. Tyson had quick feet. Tyson would get inside, then Tyson would start bouncing. He would get under you. You couldn't keep him outside. Right here, Andy just doesn't have the foot speed in this fight to race in on Anthony Joshua. I know Joshua is a hellacious puncher, but you've got to bob and weave. You've got to find a way to get inside. Let me also say this too. AJ's throwing a stiff jab. One of the knocks on Joshua, and I've discussed it here, not Joshua, but Ruiz, and I've discussed it here online before, is Andy really doesn't have a back foot game. In other words, had AJ been fighting Tyson Fury and he starts throwing a stiff jab, a Fury would have backed up, right? A Fury would have backed up, let the jab stop here, right? I mean, why are you coming forward walking into a jab? A Fury would have backed up, let the jab stop here, used his own lateral movement. So the guys would be playing a cat and mouse game about the point of entry. Right here, Andy doesn't really have a back foot game. You don't see Andy suddenly get on his toes, start backing up, trying to throw his own jab. Now Andy's walking into AJ's jab and he's doing it in slow motion. Right? He's not running in. He's not trying to tackle AJ. Right? What I want him to do is to look at some Bernard Hopkins films. Right, Bernard puts his head down. Bernard John Pascal. Bernard at times would put his head down and then just run in. Right. By the way, congratulations to Bernard as well as Juan Manuel Marquez on getting into Hall of Fame. I hope people realize both men lost their first fight. Right. For young fighters watching this video, it's possible. Well, understand, AJ just put on what Eddie Hearn called a master class. 
it was impressive. I got to tell you, I was looking at AJ bouncing around in the 11th round, and I was just astonished. Right? I got the feeling that AJ, as good as he was fighting, and it was a masterful performance, actually started gaining confidence as the fight went along. In other words, he's moving from the opening bell, right? But he's a little bit more tentative. In the 11th round, he's actually bouncing a little bit, right? He's bouncing. Who knows? Maybe he's going to start doing a shuffle. Who knows? Maybe he'll get the level of confidence where he's bouncing around and he's actually following up that stiff jab with straight right hands, right? Maybe, maybe he's going to try to create traps. So when Andy comes in and thinks he has a pocket that he could crash, maybe AJ's going to have an uppercut waiting for him. Right? But let's just say, I'm shocked. I wasn't expecting this. Not in the slightest. The stamina surprised me. AJ's accuracy and ability to throw that jab with power surprised me. AJ's ability to clinch on demand. I'm still, folks, I didn't see this the first fight. In fact, I haven't seen this in any AJ fight. When AJ gets off the canvas against Vladimir Klitschko, he isn't able to tie up Vladimir Klitschko like this. Right? This is a champion who is evolving. Let me also say, you know, I heard AJ was making something like, according to some reports, $60 million for this fight. One of the biggest paydays in boxing history. So then I saw him looking really thin. And I thought, this is a farewell fight. Right? He's going to come in. He's going to give it his best. He's going to try to be on his back foot. But if it doesn't work out, I thought he was going to hang it up. He has money in the bank, right? He could say, hey, I tried to regain the title. It didn't work out for me. He would leave with two losses, right? I'm astonished that they were able to pull this off. Simply astonished. I'll say this too. Um, greatness comes from having a standard above and beyond what it takes to win. Right? I've never seen AJ pump this many jabs. I've never seen AJ move this much. Right? I hope AJ, even with opponents that he could just blast out of the pocket, right? I hope AJ continues to develop this style. Right? I hope AJ doesn't gain the weight back right away. I hope AJ at 6'6", six, six, less than 240, right, continues to develop this level of movement, right? Um, let me also say this too, and I don't say it lightly. Andy Ruiz has really some of the fastest hands I've ever seen at heavyweight. You wouldn't know it here because he never gets going. AJ is able to grab him too much throws Andy off his rhythm. But what I want is for people to look at the heavyweight division. Because you have some characters right now that have made this division the best it's been in years. Right? This is better than it was during the Vladimir Klitschko era. Right? You have AJ. Two-handed power. Unlike Deontay Wilder. Gifted puncher with both hands. And he's just shown you a game plan where he doesn't rely on power, where he's relying on movement. Afterwards, in the post-fight interview, he talked about the sweet science. So we really don't know which AJ would show up at this point against a Tyson Fury or a Deontay Wilder who doesn't move that well but who has dropped every man he's faced. So you have the fastest hands I've seen in a while, a boxer who's a switch, 
He can blow you out, flat-footed, or he can jab you on the move and try to not engage, try to not have a pocket set up. Then you have a guy with one of the biggest punches in heavyweight history, right? I wouldn't call it punching power, I call it a punch because he doesn't really have other punches around it. In Deontay Wilder, and then you have the guy who I think's the best of the bunch, but I have to admit, he's a wild card. Tyson Fury, right? Fury hasn't looked as good to me in his comeback as he looked when he beat Vladimir Klitschko, as he looked in the fights leading up to that. Right, so Fury's a wild card. Fury's the Joker. Right, you have Andy who's still dangerous. Right, Andy's the fast-handed guy. Deontay Wilder is the guy with the golden punch, but not the gifted puncher. Right, let me add another name. Who was at the fight? You have Usyk. Now, I'll just tell you, I've been here online making videos about boxing matches for years. I don't have a clue what strategies the guys would use in the AJ Usyk matchup if that ever happens. Understand, Usyk, AJ wants to be undisputed at heavy. Understand that Usyk was undisputed at cruiser. Right? Understand, Usyk can move. But there's an open question on Usyk's punching power at heavyweight. Right? So, all I can say, and it's the end of 2019, all I can say is buckle up. You have some great heavyweight fights coming up. Whatever the guys decide. Right? I'm looking forward to Wilder Fury. Right? I believe either Fury wins that fight, outboxes Wilder, maybe comes inside and takes out Wilder. Or Wilder wins the fight by KO. I don't see Wilder outboxing Fury. But I have to tell you, I lost big on this fight because I didn't see AJ outboxing Andy Ruiz. Right? Let me say this too. In the pre-fight video, I thought there were some structural problems AJ couldn't solve. Right? Andy's hand speed. AJ's lack of defense. AJ solves both with movement and accuracy. Right? AJ prevents combinations from happening because he's moving away from Andy's punches. AJ prevents his defense from becoming an issue because he's grabbing Andy. So boxing right now, the heavyweight division in particular, is a big chess match. I believe this is the best that it's been in quite some time. Let me add some other names too. I had Alexander Povetkin. <laughs> I had the underdog, Alexander Povetkin, against Michael Hunter. And let's just say I was horrified that first round. Hunter comes in, he's throwing chopping right hands. He hurts Prevetkin out the gate. Right now, Prevetkin is one of the heavyweight division's most mobile heavyweights. Right? So just understand <laughs> that after a great beginning, as Hunter moved away, Povetkin was able to move with him. Quite frankly, I believe Chris Mannix was right. I believe Povetkin knocked down Hunter. When Hunter gets hit, falls into the ropes. Now, why is it important? It's because the fight was ruled a draw. <laughs> it's important to gamblers like me because we had the underdog. We got robbed of a nice return. Let me also say, I know on the telecast, Mora and Brian Kenny disagreed. I'm not sure if I know why, because they showed the replay. And, you know, let's just say it's clear that Hunter falls into the ropes, right? He's not leaning into the ropes. No, he falls into the ropes off a shot, right? 
and they try to give the referee cover. They tell you, well, it's really hard for a ref in the middle of the action to see that. Come on now. Come on now. Hunter's getting hit with some shots. Then the action moves over to the ropes. Shouldn't one of the referee's top priorities be to see whether a punch causes a fighter to fall into the ropes? Well, just to understand, I know AJ, a different AJ, beat Povetkin already. Right? Folks, Michael Hunter would be a threat. Understand, Michael Hunter, you know, it's rock, paper, scissors. Right? I'm not necessarily saying Michael Hunter beats Andy Ruiz. But let's just say if you're AJ, it's a different fight, isn't it? Because Michael Hunter can move backwards. Right? Because in terms of foot speed, you can't circle Michael Hunter. Right? Let me also say, too, Daniel Dubois, he needs to be mentioned. Right? Understand, the new generation is here. You saw one of the guys, the Diego Pacheco guy, right, on the undercard here. Spectacular fight. Spectacular fighter. Right? Guys like Devin Haney, Virgil Ortiz, they're here now. Now, Dubois, gifted puncher, just like AJ. What happens in that fight? Is it possible that AJ could back up and use movement like he did against Andy? Is it possible since Dubois does not have Andy's hand speed that if AJ lands that clean jab or lands a clean right hand that AJ will then try to trade, try to allow a pocket to be set up knowing that he's not dealing with Andy Ruiz's hand speed. Well, I could talk about this all day. Let me just say congratulations to those of you who picked Andy, excuse me, Anthony Joshua. Uh, magnificent performance. I'm astonished. I normally don't see a fighter come up with a brand new style that involves movement and be able to pull it off over 12 rounds against a guy who's relentlessly coming forward on him with faster hands. Right? This is one of those moments that you remember. I tip my hat to AJ. He's back in the mix. Let's just say if you haven't been paying attention, that mix right now that is the heavyweight division is loaded. It's potent. Right? Boxing is the sweet science. Let's just say right now you have several different titles. Excuse me. Several different styles. Right? Competing for supremacy. That's how I see it. Let me hear from you. Big loss for me today. I'm just going to have to accept it. Uh, the Prevetkin draw. <laughs> Not happy about that. The uh, Andy Ruiz loss. Not happy about that in the slightest. It's barely 3 p.m. here on the West Coast in the United States. And let's just say already I'm in the hole today quite a bit. It's gambling. It happens. I'm an adult. I took the risks. I congratulate the winners. Thanks for stopping by.